Good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to the 2019 Toyohiko Kagawa Lecture. This lectureship was established to honor and remember the wonderful ministry of Reverend Kagawa, an international evangelist and social worker, and a graduate of Princeton Seminary in the class of 1915. We're grateful to have Dr. Ann Blankenship deliver this year's lecture. Dr. Blankenship holds a BA from the University of Puget Sound and an MA in religion from Yale Divinity School and an MA and PhD in religious studies from the University of North Carolina of Chapel Hill. She currently serves as an associate professor of religious studies at North Dakota State University. She is also the associate director of the Northern Plains Ethics Institute. Dr. Blankenship's research investigates religious responses to injustice and relationships between national, racial, and religious identities. Her first book is entitled Christianity, Social Justice, and Japanese American Incarceration During World War II. It is a study of how Japanese incarceration transformed Asian American Christianity and challenged religious and racial boundaries in our church. This book has already received high praise. A reviewer in the Christian Century proclaimed it is sure to become the definitive work on this subject. The title of Dr. Blankenship's lecture today is The Adaptability of Christian Nationalism, American Protestants and Japanese Christianity, 1921 to 1941. Please join me in welcoming her to our seminary. Well, thank you so much for inviting me um, from Professor Young and President Barnes. Um, it was certainly an honor and a surprise and exciting, happy thing to be invited. Um, when I was invited to give the Kagawa le this lecture this year, I thought about my previous work on the Japanese American incarceration, um, but also my current work, part of which concerns the Immigration Act of 1924, which ended immigration from, uh, from Asia to the U.S. On October 17, 1940, 20,000 Christians gathered at the Aoyama Gakuin campus in damp, chilly weather to celebrate the 2600th anniversary of the Japanese Empire. During the ceremony, leaders of the National Christian Council announced their intention to merge their nation's Protestants into one united Japanese church. They would break affiliations with Western denominations and blaze their own trail formally integrating Japanese values and philosophies with Christianity. This step had the potential, they believed, to perfect their religion and present a united front to Japanese missionaries working throughout the growing empire. Countless factors led to this decision. Um, the ecumenical movement, nationalistic fervor, power plays among different Japanese Christian leaders, pressure from the Ministry of Education, uh, plans for more effective ministry work, uh, and really this desire, honestly, to distance himself from Western influences and Protestantism's historical schisms. So as a disclaimer, I will talk about uh, like Western Christians or Christianity in the West, and I apologize because that's a very unnuanced uh, term, but it's what everybody, everyone I'm studying is using those terms, and so I just mean more or less white people from America and America, United States, Canada, UK, continental Europe, right, by that means. So local white missionaries, those people I just mentioned, with varying degrees of distress and approval, recognized that a new paradigm, the new paradigm left little room for them, particularly in the face of increasing tensions between Japan and the West. Several Protestant denominations had already recalled their missionaries from Japan and its occupied territories, though some stayed until the outbreak of war with the US, and later. <laughs> Across the Pacific, American Protestants didn't really know what to think. The Japanese Constitution of 1889 guaranteed freedom of religion, but they still suspected government interference. They also worried that Japanese Christians were participating in pagan rituals of emperor worship under the guise of patriotism. 
Participation in civil religious rituals required by the state and the formation of a national Protestant church led some Americans to accuse the Japanese government of interfering with Christians' religious liberty. Tensions came to a climax when architects of the United Church of Christ in Japan visited the US in April 1941, just eight months before their nation bombed Hawaii. My talk today will chart the interwar history of the US-Japan Protestant relations and their perspective on religious freedom and national identity. I'll focus on the perspectives of America's Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America, the FCC, and members of the Kyodon, that united church that they're building. While Protestant peace activists identified Christianity as the world's only chance for a just and durable peace, many Japanese Christian leaders allied their religion with the military aspirations of the Japanese emperor. Empire. I argue that American Protestants' inability or unwillingness to understand the complexity of religion and politics in Japan, as well as Japan's definitions of religion and religious freedom, lay at the root of their inability to connect with Japanese Christians. Toyohiko Kagawa, for whom this lectureship, of course, is named, um, exacerbated American Protestants' misinterpretation because he fed their desire to see Christianity as a source for international peace. I also want to insist on the point that the Christianity devised in Japan at this time was as authentic an expression as any other. Um, a lot of scholars today still have this tendency to excuse nationalistic aspects of Japanese Christianity as something that they were forced into, but that frequently wasn't the case, as I hope to show. Anyone living in the US today obviously witnesses how Christians have made American exceptionalism an integral part of their religious beliefs um, similarly. So you can reject that as Christianity or take them for what they're saying, seriously. So it turns out that Christians in other countries do that as well, shocking. The adaptability of Christian nationalism, its universalism, is another of the primary points. I'll start by providing some historical background and then explain the situation, first from the Japanese perspective and then look at discussions in the US. So Christianity first entered Japan in 1549 through Jesuit priests, but it was outlined by the Tokugawa shogunate um, less than a century later when they isolated the nation from all outside contact. Um, Christians after that point faced gruesome torture and execution, often by crucifixion, if they refused to recant their beliefs. It was kind of like a la Roman Empire-esque. Uh, approximately 30,000 people, though, still practice a semblance of Christianity in 1853 when Commodore Matthew Perry from the US forced the country open. Missionaries soon entered the country and Christi Christianity was legalized two decades later. As part of the Meiji Restoration, the rapidly modernizing nation, soon to become an empire, reorganized itself as a constitutional monarchy. Excuse me. So now we can look at that slide. Oh no, if I can make it come. There we go. Okay, so Article 28 <laughs> of the, that Meiji era constitution promised subjects of the Japanese empire the right to religious belief within limits not prejudicial to peace and order and not antagonistic to their duties as subjects. That's a bit vague, leaves a lot open for interpretation, but it's pretty typical of religious liberty laws at that time. So part of this was about emulating Western nations and their acceptance of religious liberty as a desirable goal. Um, the duties of subjects, specifically, involved adherence to elements extracted from Shintoism, which included rites that conferred divinity upon the emperor. Students in Japan and its colonies were required to recite um, the imperial rescript on education and bow to the text and pictures of the emperor. The rescript exalted Confucian values and instructed Japanese subjects to, quote, maintain the prosperity of our imperial throne coeval with heaven and earth. These sacred objects were housed in these huandens, or little shrines that were built at every school throughout the country. The government officially defined these rituals as secular civic practices. Um, to avoid, of course, violating Article 28. Outsiders problematically labeled this uh, during the war and after, certainly, 
as um, state Shinto, right, which probably sounds familiar. I would identify this as civil religious practices, um, however you want to label it, because Japan never instituted it as their official state religion, despite attempts of people during the wartime to do so. Um, Jolin Thomas, a if you know him, he was a recent Princeton grad, published a fantastic book um, just this spring that traces Buddhist arguments about religious freedom um, in the pre-war era, and then um, kind of US occupiers reinterpretation of these ideas. So I recommend you take a look at it. Most Christians throughout the empire complied with these things, and the Vatican authorized Roman Catholics to participate. This is not to say life was hunky-dory for Japanese Christians. Uh, some, including Kagawa, were periodically arrested, and their connection to Western missionaries increasingly drew criticism from people who connected the religion with foreign interference. The immense social pressure to conform also led to discrimination, um, and individuals who refused to participate in state Shinto rituals were penalized. While Christian schools in Japan complied with orders related to the imperial rescript, some missionary schools in Korea refused and suffered consequences. The religious climate in Japan shifted again with the 1939 Religious Organizations Law, which reinterpreted Article 28. The law required the consolidation of religious sects and the necessity for religious groups to seek official authorization through the Ministry of Education. So in response to that, we get the meeting I described at the beginning. So uh, representatives met and passed a resolution to unite the churches at that time. So all but a few Anglican churches, Seventh-day Adventists, and some holiness churches complied with this request to unify. These unauthorized groups lost their tax-exempt status, and more crucially, the protection and approval that came with state oversight. If they wished to continue evangelizing and opening churches, Christians had little choice but to comply. Uh, the salvation even went out of its way to adopt sacramental rites, which they do not normally have, in order to join this church. So people were making the big compromises. Uh, prominent members of the National Christian Council had lobbied for a united church for over a decade, so they were very pleased. And the religious organization law essentially gave them an excuse uh, to fulfill their vision. The law also made room to formally recognize Christianity as a Japanese religion specifically. While Japan's wartime persecution of minority faiths shouldn't be ignored, definitely, uh, members of the Kyodan were generally protected, as were colonial subjects who chose to join the state-sponsored missions in connection um, with the Kyodan as part of, um, remember Japan had this idea of creating this greater East Asia group co-prosperity sphere. I always have to read that. It's such a long title. Um, so there are studies by Emily Anderson and Mark Mullins um, that give us a lot of ideas about this Christianity made in Japan and what that looks like. Um, but Mullins, in, I disagree with us, he dismisses the United Church as an inauthentic indigenous Christianity outright. And I see them as repeating the errors of a lot of uh, the American Protestant contemporaries at this time who couldn't bring themselves to believe the nationalistic aims of many Japanese Christians. Notably, the, national, the Japanese language Christian press at that time expressed significantly stronger nationalistic attitudes than were found in the English language publications. So I think also a lot of these missionaries, um, certainly many of them were flown in Japanese and would have been reading those. Lots of them were reading the kind of whitewashed version. Um, many, I mean many, some Japanese Christian leaders advocated for an explicit imperial Christianity. The Methodist bishop Tokyo Kugimiya explained, we believe, that the agent, the, we believe that the august will of God is using our race for a great purpose here in Asia. This blend of racial supremacy, nationalism, and religion almost perfectly reflected American Protestant views from a few decades earlier. The popular of controversial social gospeler Josiah Strong had written that Anglo-Saxon Christianity would dominate the world just by virtue of its superiority. Kyodan leaders believed the Japanese people could construct a perfected Christianity once separated from Western influences. Missionaries of both religions, uh, Buddhism, um, Buddhism and Christianity actually, supported colonization efforts as a way to spread and refine their faiths. Japanese evangelists, so this map kind of, 
I added it because it kind of helps uh, to understand like the extent of um, Japan. So everything but that dark purple was already under Japanese occupation before the US entered the war, right? I mean, they took the Philippines and all of that later on. Um, but significant parts of China, and they had Korea for decades at that point already. And Japanese evangelists began trailing their triumphal army as early as 1895, when a Christian chaplain notified Japanese Presbyterians of Taiwan's potential as a missionary field. You see Taiwan in the pink. It's one of the earliest places they took over. New theologies bound evangelism with colonization, reinforcing each other as Japanese Protestants expanded their work to Korea, Manchuria, and northern China. While the Japanese government may not have heartily supported that Christian minority, they recognized its potential. These new territories had existing churches that could and would uh, be sources for rebellion against the occupation. So if there were, you know, Kyodan official Japanese Christian missionaries, um, they hoped that could control the at least that segment of the local populace. Um, and then they were under, of course, the same stipulations as the rest of the empire at that point. Um, they also, Japanese Christian leaders also um, helped the military by replacing what displaced Western missionaries as they you know, took over more land at that point. Uh, these Japanese affiliated churches were not very popular, not surprisingly, uh, particularly in Korea. Um, but they did offer tax relief and protection in a quite dangerous climate. Christian schools, under um, increased suspicion for their foreign ties and influence on youth, faced the greatest challenge, and most had to cease worship services and religious education if they weren't willing to play along. In addition to evangelism, the National, mm -hmm. National Christian Council joined colonization efforts by planting um, numerous Christian agrarian colonies in Manchuria. So they're very enthusiastic, but they unfortunately chose a lot of settlers who either had no farming experience um, or you know, just struggled working in this very different climate than they were used to. Um, third problem, um, they had been told, of course, that this was, I mean, the standard line of colonization. This is an empty land. Come and make it fruitful. Um, it, of course, there are people living there who had to be displaced, and this didn't really help with their whole mission of expanding peaceful relations with their co-Asians, at least on the part of some of the Christians involved. So I don't want to give the impression at all that all Christians in Japan by any means were involved in these kind of nationalistic and colonization efforts. Um, Kugawa's responses were slightly mixed. Um, and certainly there were activists who spoke out against them, um, the militarization, but not all of that many. <laughs> so um, how do people think about this from the US? Mainland Protestants, um, and again, mainland Protestants, that's one of those terms that's anachronistic, but it's just easy. I mean, like Presbyterians, Northern Baptists, uh, Methodists, all those guys. Um, members of the Federal Council of Churches, in short. Um, so they had promoted these campaigns for peace and new world order since the conclusion of World War I. Until the attack on Pearl Harbor, their publications and editorials heralded pacifism and non-intervention. Mainland campaigns for the banishment of war called for a new international morality that would subordinate narrow self-interest to the interests of all. Under the auspices of the FCC, John Foster Dulles publicized his Six Pillars of Peace Campaign ethical guidelines um, with an underlying liberal foundation. This brand of liberalism lauded what they saw as a universal moral code uh, that wouldn't require everybody to convert, but it were common ideals everyone they thought could agree on. And they insisted that Christianity was potentially the only avenue to peace. Um, so they were eager to find international allies um, particularly places in heightened tension like Japan. So mainland Protestants also dominated really uh, mission fields in Japan at this time, and they were engaged with Japanese American missionary work um, on the West Coast, sort of stuff I talk about in my book. 
Um, but as Japan's international power grew and nativist Americans began lobbying for immigration restrictions, ties to Japan and its citizens became increasingly politicized. Protestant and Roman Catholic missionaries were the primary champions of Asian immigrants in the first half of the 20th century, but leaders of the FCC's peace organizations had even greater concerns than missions and the welfare of immigrants. They saw this discrimination as the greatest threat to peace between the US and Japan. So in light of these concerns, uh, progressive Protestants formed, of course, what did they do? They formed committees <laughs> to sustain peace. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, I'll try to be quick about all these committees they formed. So uh, at the request of missionaries working in Japan, they um, had already formed the Commission on Relations with Japan in 1914, uh, the FCC's more political joint committee on right relations between Sh America and Japan, um, later was advocating very specific political policies, so policy reforms on naturalization, um, disarmament, trade, immigration, uh, and the cultivation of, quote, a more wholesome public opinion on American-Japanese relations. So by this point, they're really getting their hands dirty and you know, jumping into politics. The FCC starts off being a little bit hesitant, um, even in the early 20s, about making those definitive stands, but uh, they get over that pretty quickly. Uh, so they were writing editorials, uh, they distributed loads of like informational brochures, like these. Um, they were on speaking tours, and they were also petitioning Congress directly and the president to oppose immigration quotas. Renamed the National Committee on American-Japanese Relations, that group argued that discrimination against Japanese Americans uh, exacerbated international tensions by supporting Japan's claim that white people would never treat other races fairly, which is true. Um, Sidney Gulick, a missionary with 26 years of experience in Japan, led this crusade, that's his pamphlet there in the middle, arguing on both religious and secular grounds. He correctly predicted that this would harm um, international relations beyond just a question of immigration. Um, so all of these efforts, especially those in line with Dulles's peace campaign, assumed a liberal, global, ecumenical image of Christianity. Uh, despite growing nationalism everywhere um, and violence, they insisted that Christianity held the key. However, many expressed reservations that American Christians uh, weren't quite ready for that global leadership role. So they failed to prevent these immigration restrictions from happening. Uh, they shift to uh, trying to overthrow ideas of the Japanese bogey, right? Just this uh, vague international threat. They are rising power, they'll be competitive, they'll be, you know, the economy, all these different things, right? They're going to take over the standard anti-immigration <laughs> rhetoric that you hear. Um, and so the FCC committees explained Japan's growing militarism as the inevitable and necessary response to Western militarism. Uh, while condemning militarism on both sides, they believed that better insight and sympathy for Japan's problems would support uh, the arguments of the more liberal or moderate politicians in Japan. Uh, so they were thinking through this on multiple levels. Um, and even when they really strongly kept standing up for the Japanese, like right through the 30s, um, and when uh, so when Japan uh, kind of invaded Manchuria in 1931, most of the US was fairly sympathetic, partially because the Chinese missionaries were really good at talking about like these hordes of Japanese that are after us, which fed racist imaginations of the Japanese. And that was a lot easier to buy than, well, really it's uh, not Japan's fault because uh, this kind of shady um, explanation. Um, but by 1938, um, the opinions of Japanese actions had shifted so significantly um, that the FCOC was criticizing even American Christians um, who were implicated through investments in firms which traffic in war supplies. Um, so they were absolutely right to be worried that this was going, you know, these negative policies against Japan and trade and immigration were going to have uh, repercussions 
uh, support for a national church frequently came in direct response to international criticism of the Japanese military actions. Um, that was in order to distance themselves from foreign missionaries, right? While national, well, Japanese Christians may not have approved of the brutal tactics employed in China, they understood outside criticism, such as the condemnation from the Archbishop of Canterbury as racist imperial interference. Foreign responses increased international support for Japan's policies just as American Protestants had warned. In December 1937, 45 Japanese Christian leaders signed a letter to the world's Christians defending Japan's military actions. They lamented the loss of life, but ultimately blamed the Chinese and also Western Christians for making those actions necessary. Um, Japanese language Christian publications, not surprisingly also, uh, became more and more hostile throughout the 1930s. The Fukuin Shinpo, for example, distanced itself from Western values completely and criticized American and British interference with East Asian Christianity. So American missionaries working in Japan, of course, had their own position on some of this. Um, I'll just kind of summarize. Some were would supported Japan just absolutely um, and say this is completely America's fault. They're being aggressive. Um, Japan has no choice but to do these things or just ignore Japanese aggression entirely. Um, some were more realistic. This one guy, Galen Fisher, he had actually left Japan in 1919. He understood that like, this war is going to happen. This is inevitable. And so he actually shifted his work to Japanese Americans on the West Coast because he knew they would bear the brunt of these things. So he was working with them and kind of trying to protect rights and things like this. Um, a couple of years before Pearl Harbor, which is devastating for that community, of course. Um, so here we have Kagawa. I bet everybody who's given this lecture has shown this picture. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, I think it's my picture of a picture from the archives. <laughs> but there he is, right here. I don't know what building that is, but looks like lots of them around here. So. Could be just about anything. Um, so ecumenical Protestants were certainly influenced by Kagawa's work. He was a Christian pacifist whose speaking tours in 1936 reached over uh, three quarters of a million Americans. Uh, so his name appeared regularly like in the New York Times, so secular publications as well as Christian publications that talked about him very, very regularly. Um, he was known as uh, your president explained for his social work with the poor um, issues like this, but um, he also discouraged um, leaders from even speaking about foreign missions in order to forget these national and racial differences. Right? He was not hesitant to criticize Western policies. Um, you know, their capitalism and other things, not just related to their international relations. Um, but he knew this would be a major obstacle to proselytization, of course, at first. However, um, he adopted a lot of the nationalistic rhetoric about Japan's kind of heroic role as the protector of Asia and like good um, Christianity from the evil West. Um, the stuff the government was saying, right? Um, and while he professed, I think, sincerely to loathe the violence of colonization, he chaired the Manchurian Christian Settlement Support Committee. So he was still involved. Um, scholars disagree quite vigorously about uh, the extent of his pacifism, and I'm not going to make an argument one way or the other. Um, but it's, I think, important to know he was integrating, he and others were integrating a lot of these uh, nationalistic kind of tendencies. Um, so Western missionaries at this time, I mean, like here's the white Americans, Protestants in the US, uh, were quite distressed by this point in time, right? They supported 
ec ecumenism, right? They were gonna make all of the Japanese, they didn't know this yet, but they were about to make all the Japanese Americans worship ecumenically once they were incarcerated. Um, but they didn't really like it when it was happening outside of their purview. And um, especially because it really, it, it was just a logistical problem, right? If you have a united national church, where are all those denominational missionaries supposed to go, right? Um, and they're increasingly unwelcome in Japan and, you know, at this time as well. Um, so to address these concerns, um, I thought this was sort of amazing. This whole delegation of Japanese Christians, a um, little picture of them too. There they are. Sorry for the quality of that. Um, this whole delegation comes to Riverside, California uh, in April 1941, right? Not long before things go south. Um, there was some concern about this meeting, whether this was a good idea or not, but uh, certainly many, and I agree with them, interpreted this as a sign that Japanese Christians were committed to peaceful endeavors, right? That this was a priority. So in the US, this was framed as an act of brotherhood that transcended political tensions. Uh, one of the attendees, Methodist Walter W. Van Kirk, who was a vocal advocate of Japanese missions, an executive secretary of the FCC's Commission on International Justice and Goodwill, told the New York Times that the two groups met to jointly seek forgiveness for the aims, for the, sorry, jointly seek forgiveness for the sins and wrongdoings of their respective countries. Van Kirk's statement took paternalistic ownership of Japanese Christians on behalf of American missionaries, calling them their spiritual children. So given the J Japan's pride at creating their own Christianity at this point in time, and the growing resentment of foreign missionaries, I think this didn't go over particularly well. A uh, few Japanese delegates offered apologies, um, still fewer were seeking forgiveness for any of their actions. And these talks revolved around America's two greatest, con the Americans, uh, two greatest concerns. So worship at the Shinto shrines and the United Church. Um, the Japanese spokesman right off assured Americans that their participation in the Shinto rituals was not religious and denied any government interference outright with their new hierarchical structure. Differentiating between political, patriotic and religious shrines, um, the lay leader Tsunejira Matsuyama used the government's language really to argue that Christians could participate in these ceremonies without a conflict of interest. Right, so American attendees who were eager to reconcile what was going on, and that was mm, a lot of them, uh, kind of compared this to, you know, uh, our like saying the Pledge of Allegiance, things like this, um, and indeed saying the Pledge of Allegiance, which didn't include the word God at that point yet. Um, the Supreme Court had just said it's mandatory and not a violation of religious liberty um, the year before this. No, yeah. Yeah, just the year before. So there's, uh, I mean, this, I guess this is why I think um, there was some sort of blockage um, that a lot of these American Protestants just didn't understand that, uh, you know, they didn't recognize what they were doing and how that would look in another country. And I think Japanese culture is so significantly different that made it difficult. But a lot of these people had worked in Japan for decades, so I don't know, it's not a great excuse. Um, so there was an anonymous report on the other, oh, actually, uh, this one line I did want to read. Um, Bishop Kugimiya spoke that a little bit more directly, God, that God had intended Japan to expand, so the, empire, the emperor could have been seen as God's agent. It's kind of a new Cyrus, worthy of honor. Most of them didn't go that far. Um, I, didn't, I haven't seen anything that goes that far. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, they did talk about nationalism kind of as this ideology during the conference. I'm, I'm, most of this is from like all the notes that people were taking during the conference and there was this idea that you were either nationalistic or you were Christian. And there was just like no way that these could be um, either accepted in parallel, but much less actually integrated in the way that they were, um, despite the role Christianity had played in you know, the Spanish-American War, 
uh, in our other colonization efforts at this time. So while several of the individuals um, kind of remain critical of the Japanese Christian's adoption of these civil religious rituals, um, all of the Americans unanimously approved of the church union in principle, even if they were kind of suspicious about its autonomy, right? They were concerned that Japan was, uh, you know, playing puppet master, what have you, over this. Um, and again, the delegates explained that this new religion, religious organizations law uh, simply stimulated, quote, stimulated the latent urge of church union, right? They had already wanted this. This wasn't because they had to. Um, they insist these things over and over again. They even cite Kagawa. I mean, Kagawa was part of this delegation. You ever, I have a guess which one he is, but not a good enough one to circle him. So uh, he quotes Kagawa saying like, our desire was to be one in Christ, so we decided to be part of an ecumenical church. Um, that Kagawa's leadership was crucial within this. Um, that overstates his role in the politics of this united church, for sure. It, Kagawa didn't seem to have many, as far as I can tell, many Japanese allies. Um, you know, certainly, he, you know, he had a very clear intention of what his vision of Christianity in Japan um, and I think it was a little more progressive than most people were interested in doing. And so, um, not that they disagreed with him, and they, but they certainly understood that he was a great tool to use in America because everybody liked him. So if Kagawa says it's okay, well then it must be, right? Um, so this visit pronounced their independence but also their desire to sustain communion and peace with America. They didn't have to go to this effort to, I mean, this is, everybody thinks war is gonna start, right, by this point in time. They think it's inevitable. So to come was a very grand gesture and to pay for it, not a cheap visit. Um, so, I skipped down to. Um, a lot of these Japanese Christians were, this was not really discussed at the conference, but a lot of them had a very defining role within the expanding empire. Um, Matsuyama, one of the people I mentioned, was a member of the Japanese parliament and the NCC and director of the Nanking Colonization Company. I mean, he wasn't a pacifist Christian just observing this. He was actively engaged I mean, in the revenue as well as um, the engagement of all of these actions. Um, so I think they kind of played down the role of imperial, this idea of imperial Christianity, certainly when they were there. Um, but they were blending their Christianity with national politics and pride, right? Um, following very much in the footsteps of what Buddhists were doing in Japan at that time. Um, but also, I think, taking a cue from the enmeshed roles of religion and politics in the U.S. Um, one of the delegates complained that young Americans were acting to, uh, disturbingly, yeah, disturbingly nationalistic when he visited. I, I wish he had expanded on that. I don't know. But uh, so I will finish up. Um, so a month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Kyodan leaders visited Issei Jingu, uh, the Imperial Shinto Shrine, to formally proclaim their church's Japanese character and the nationalistic aims to the imperial deities. They prayed for the emperor and empire and pledged their allegiance to it. Within a year, they had instructed member churches to begin services by bowing in the direction of the imperial palace. Uh, they were instructed to sing hymns to the emperor and pray for the country's increasing number of military martyrs. They rescheduled Christmas one year because it fell on a national holiday of uh, commemorating a previous emperor. Um, and they excised songs about peace or God as a creator or a judge from hymnals. Um, by 1944, the Ministry of Education began assigning sermon themes via the Kyodan headquarters. Um, so I question the guy, Mark Mullins, who I mentioned earlier, I question his assumption that the church's military fundraising, another aspect was purely to show, quote, uh, that it was fully behind the government's war effort. Um, but they, 
obviously lost substantial autonomy during the Pacific War. Things escalated very quickly after Pearl Harbor. Um, while they may, I think, were fully independent up until that point, um, you know, it gave way a possibility for government interference at that point in time. Um, in 1966, it's kind of interesting, the Kyodan still exists. They released a very controversial confession and apology for its complicity in the war. Um, it did not suggest that their actions were performed under duress. Uh, they state that this was out of sincere belief in the war effort, right? They weren't trying to find excuses for these nationalistic um, efforts, though they now see them as incorrect, right? And you can find that on their website even today. In the two decades following the war, American missionaries working in Japan acknowledged that Japanese Christians made some questionable choices during the war but generally praised their loyalty and patriotism as positive attributes, or at least excused the behavior. Characteristic of the US government's um, kind of instantaneous allegiance with former Axis powers at the close of the war, missionaries found it easier to relegate these crimes to the past. Um, a few noted that Westerners could not be the first to throw a stone in this regard, and the Japanese certainly won't be the first or last Christians to use their religion in service of empire. Thank you. <laughs>